Hi there. Welcome to our 10-part series on music theory for a beginning band. The work that we'll be doing in this course comes out of Mark Sarnecki's Complete Elementary Music Rudiments book. Um, we'll be following lots and lots of different topics as we move throughout. But first, a little bit about music theory. The study of theory is an important part of a complete musical education. Familiarity with basic concepts of music theory aids in musical literacy, including notation, sight reading, ear training, and memory. Our sessions are a comprehensive rudiments course covering notation, pitch, the keyboard, rhythm, meter, key signatures, major and minor scales, intervals, chords, modal scales, and beginning harmony. So we'll carry cover a lot. This course is designed to be used in a number of ways, including self-study, one-on-one music teaching, and as a text for group study in the classroom, like we'll be doing. It is suitable for use by all instrumentalists and vocalists, whether you play piano or not. The information is presented in a clear, concise, and systematic manner and the easy-to-understand workbook format offers you, the student, plenty of exercise to practice and master the concept of music rudiments. So this week, we're going to take a look at three different topics. We're going to look at music notation, time values, and semitones, whole tones, and accidentals. So let's jump in. Starting with music notation. So, sound in music is symbolized through notes. We've all seen these notes. You know, they're the circles sometimes with the sticks coming off them. Notes tell us the pitch. That's how high or low, and the duration, how long or short a sound is. Notes are placed on the staff, which consists of five lines and four spaces. So, we can see here that we have five lines, one, two, three, four, five, and four spaces. One, two, three, four. Notes are given different names using the first seven letters of the alphabet. So that's A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Signs called clefs are placed at the beginning of each staff. So here we have a treble clef or G clef because it curls around the second line of the staff indicating the location of G. The bass clef, or F clef, has two dots on either side of the fourth line of the staff indicating the location of F. So, here are the names of the notes on the treble and bass staves. There are different ways to remember the names of the notes. Um, the best way is to just sort of memorize what they look like, but if you need some help to remember the line notes in the treble clef, you can see that we have E, G, B, D, F. Um, you can see a few different options here of ways to remember that, but I like to think of every good boy deserves fudge. There's no device to remember the spaces in the treble clef except to think of face. It spells out the word face. Now, when we look at the spa the lines on the bass clef, um, I like to think of good boys deserve fudge always. So it's the same device, only the notes are changed a little bit. But if you're trying to remember the spaces in the bass clef, you could consider American composers envy Gershwin or the most common, all cows eat grass. Now, please take some time to finish pages five and six before continuing on to the ledger line section. Great. Continuing on. So small lines called ledger lines are used to extend the range of the staff. 
These lines are used for notes that are above or below the five lines of the treble and bass staves. Here are some examples that include notes up to three ledger lines above and below the staff, but even more ledger lines may be added above and below if you wish to extend the range of the staff. So we can hear here that the ledger lines allow us to extend things a far way. If we were limited by the notes on the staff, all we would have is from the pitches E to F. By adding those ledger lines, just by the examples that we have here, we've extended it much, much, much further from an F an octave lower, which we haven't discussed yet, to an E an octave higher. So we can hear that that goes from here to here. The same can be said for the bass clef ledger lines. They extend it just as far. The treble and bass staves combine to make the grand staff. The two staves are joined by a straight line and a curved brace or bracket. So a grand staff has to have these two pieces at the beginning. So the line connecting the two staves and the bracket putting them together as well. With that, can you please finish pages 8 and 9 of your workbook before coming back? Great. Continuing on, hopefully all the notes and their positions made a lot of sense to you. If not, please don't hesitate to get in contact with me and I'll try to clarify everything for you. Moving on to time values. In music, different types of notes are used to indicate different lengths or durations of sounds. Remember, we said before that it pitch is how high or low, and duration, the amount of time, short or long. So we're dealing with duration. Different types of rest are used to indicate different lengths or durations of silence. So we can see here, we use sort of the same terminology, whether it's a rest or it's note, they obviously look very different. So our first note, the note that's just a circle with no stem, is called a whole note. We'll talk value in a few moments. Our whole rest comes off the second from top line and goes underneath. I like to think of that second to top line being the ground, and I'm making a hole in the ground, even though in this case, hole means all of as opposed to a hole. The second note is a half note. This is worth half of a whole note. Our half rest goes above the third line. For me, I think it kind of looks like a top half, a top hat, sorry, and hat sort of sounds like half. So that was how when I was young, I remembered a half rest from a whole rest. Then we've got our quarter note, which is worth one quarter of a whole note. We'll find out later that generally speaking, our quarter note is our basic beat, is worth one beat. So when we go backwards, the half note is worth two and the whole note is worth four. Our quarter rest is this kind of squiggly line. Um, you don't need to copy exactly what it looks like. While we're in class one day, I'll make sure to draw one up for you so you can see how easy they can be to draw. Our eighth note is like our quarter note, but with a tail on it. And our eighth rest is very simple. A line on one side with a dot connected to it. Almost kind of like an R, but... A bit different, obviously. Our 16th and 32nd notes just add more tails. And our 16 and 32nd rests just add more dots. When 8th, 16th, and 32nd notes appear alone, they have a small curved line called a flag. So each of these, our 8th note has one. Our 16th has two flags, and our 32nd note has three flags. 
However, when two or more of these notes occur, they are usually joined by lines called beams. So we can see here they've got two eighth notes together. So instead of doing two individual ones with flags, they've drawn a beam across. With the 16th, two beams. And with the 32nd, three beams. So those beams are imitating the flags. Here you can sort of see the breakdown as things go. So we have a whole note, which breaks into two half notes, which each of those break into two quarter notes, which each of those break into two eighth notes, and each of those break into two sixteenths, and they could keep going if necessary. This picture just illustrates it a little bit differently than the way it's illustrated in your book. Neither one is right or wrong compared to the other. They're just different ways of looking at it. So, we can see here another chart on page 14 that breaks down our beats. So, I mentioned previously that our quarter note is our basic beat in music, usually. So, we have our quarter note. It's worth one beat. Anything less or shorter than a quarter note, I should say, is worth a fraction of that beat. So, an eighth is a half, a sixteenth is a quarter, a 32nd is an eighth. And when we go lower, they're worth multiples. So when we go bigger, two quarter notes are equal to a half note, so two beats. And four quarter notes are equal to a whole note. So it is worth four beats as well. A dot placed after a note or rest increases the length or the duration of that note or rest by half its value. So when you see a dot next to a note, you are going to add half of its durational value to itself. So here we see a whole note with a dot equals a whole note plus a half note, six beats. A half note with a dot equals a whole note, I mean a half note plus a quarter note, so that's equal to three beats. A dotted quarter note is worth a quarter note plus an eighth note, one and a half beats. A dotted eighth note is equal to an eighth note plus a sixteenth note, or three quarters of a beat. And the same is true for all the rests that go along with those. Please take a few minutes to finish question one on page 15 before we continue with time values. Great. That looks like you totally get what's going on. So let's continue with our time values. Notice where the dots are placed beside the notes and rests in the staff if they have a dot next to them. For a note in a space, the dot goes in the same space. For a note on a line, the dot goes in the space above. For a rest, the dot goes in the third space of the staff. So here we see space notes, and the dots are all in the same space as the note. On the line notes, the dots are all in the space above the note. And with rests, the dots are always in the third space, as we see. A curved line is placed between two notes of the same pitch. It is called a tie. The first note is played and the sound is held for the value of both notes. So we can see here that we have two of the same note with this curve line going next to them. Essentially what we're doing is just adding them together and they are played as one sound. So a quarter note plus a quarter note, this would be equal to a half note in time. There are rules for placing stems on notes. If the note is on the middle line, the stem may go either up or down. Notes above the middle line have stems going down. Notes below the middle line have stems going up. So here we can see that when we're in the middle or low in the middle, they can go either way, so either down or up. When they, the notes go above the middle line, the stems are on the left side of the note and they go down. 
and when they're below the middle line, they're on the right side of the note going up. The way to think about it is the stem is actually on the same side of the note, but the note's rotated. So we can see that C in the space, if you have the C on the line in the next bar, you've rotated it. So it's on the same side of the head, just rotated. If a group of notes is to be joined with a beam, the note that is farthest from the third line determines the direction of all the stems under the beam. So here we look, we've got the middle line there. It goes up to an F, but only down to an A. So because it's up to an F, we'd have the stems going down. Whereas over here, the lowest note we have is an E going down and only a C above. So those ones, the stems would be going up. If the highest and lowest notes are the same distance from the third line, the position of the stem is determined by where the majority of the notes occur. If the most notes are above the third line, the stems go down. If most notes are below the third line, the stems go up. So here we see our third line. There's only two notes above and more notes below four notes below, exactly, so the stems will go up. And the same in reverse is true for the second bar. Now, please take some time to finish pages 17 through 19 in your workbooks before we continue on with accidental whole notes and semitones. Great, continuing on. Once again, if you're having any trouble, please contact me about getting help. We can either do it in person during a flex time or we can do it online, whatever works best for you. So please just let me know. So now we're moving on to semitones, whole tones, and accidentals. The piano keyboard is made up of semitones. A semitone is the shortest distance between two notes in Western art music. On the keyboard, it is the distance from one key to the next key. Black or white, C to C sharp, or D flat is a semitone. So is E to F. So here we can see it doesn't matter if it's going if there's black notes or in between or not, it's always the next adjacent note. It's really great to think of semitones from the top because you do see every note from the top, whereas from the bottom, sometimes we forget. So we have white to black, white to black, white to white, as long as it's the next adjacent one. Meanwhile, a whole tone is made up of two semitones. On the keyboard, a whole tone is any two keys with one key, black or white, between them. Whole tones often have two different letter names in alphabetical order. For example, C to D, or F sharp to G sharp, and A flat to B flat are all whole tones. So here we can see whole, skip one, over. Start, skip one, over over. An accidental is a sign placed in front of a note that alters its pitch by raising or lowering. Here we see that a sharp, which looks like the hashtag symbol, raises a note by one semitone. A flat, which kind of looks like a lowercase b with a point on the bottom, lowers a note by one semitone. And a natural, which is this symbol here, cancels a sharp or a flat. So here we can see the sharp and flat notes that happen in those black spaces. So F raised to F sharp, G raised to G sharp, A raised to A sharp, C raised to C sharp, and D raised to D sharp, with the same being true going the other way. G lowering to G flat, A to A flat, B to B flat, D to D flat, and E to E flat. 
Not all sharps and flats occur on black keys. For example, as we see here, E sharp, B sharp, F flat, and C flat are all played on white keys. So if we were on B and we wanted to go up, there is no black key to go to, so it would go to that next white one. Or if we were on F and we had a flat next to it, there's no black key, so it would come down to F flat. In music, the sharp, flat, or natural sign always goes in front of the note on the same line or space as the note they affect. However, when you write the letter name of a note, the sharp, flat, or natural sign goes after the letter name. For example, F sharp and B flat. So here we always see sharp F, but we call it F sharp, or flat F and F flat. When a note has been altered by an accidental, it remains altered for the remainder of the measure, unless it's changed by a new accidental. With accidentals, we can change the name of a note without changing its pitch. This type of change is called enharmonic change. So that's the word harmonic with the letters E and N before it. For example, the enharmonic equivalent of F sharp is G flat. The enharmonic equivalent of D sharp is F flat. Please take a few minutes to complete question one on page 21. Continuing on. A semitone that consists of two notes with the same letter name is called a chromatic semitone. So here we have G and G sharp, E and E flat, C sharp and C natural, B flat and B natural. So all those are considered chromatic semitones. However, a semitone that consists of two notes with different letter names is called a diatonic semitone. So G to A flat, E to D sharp, D flat to C, A sharp to B. These are all actually the same starting pitches, actually all the same pitches as the previous example, but they look different. So these are called diatonic. With that, could you please finish the questions on page 22 and 23 before we finish off by introducing some tempo markings. Great. So before we finish this month's theory, we want to introduce some different terms to know. Um, they're all terms that have to do with speed of music or tempo, and all of the terms are in Italian. So generally we can break our speeds down to three different groups in music, and that would be a slow speed, a medium speed, and a fast speed. Um, as I mentioned, all these words come from Italian, so really try to listen how I say them. You don't have to say them as an Italian would, but sometimes it adds to the effect. So, for our slow tempos, we have adagio. Adagio. Many people would call this adagio, but it's adagio. This is slow. It is slower than andante, but not as slow as largo. Next, we have lento. Lento. This means slow as well. Not our slowest tempo. Largo is very slow and broad. Larghetto is not as slow as largo. Whenever we add an etto, it means not as slow as what it's related to. 
And then we come to our medium tempos. First, we have andante, which means moderately slow or at a walking pace. Andante. Think of more of a slow walker. Then we have andantino, which means a little faster than andante. We have allegretto, which means fairly fast or a little bit slower than allegro. We have moderato, which means at a moderate pace or tempo. That's probably pretty self-explanatory from moderato. Then we get into our fast tempos. Allegro, which means fast. Presto, which means very fast. Presto, presto. And prestissimo, which means as fast as possible. These most of the tempos you're going to see are going to be in the slower or medium category right now. And maybe by the end of the year we'll see some allegro. With that, we've come to an end of this month's theory. We will have a very quick um, matching quiz with these tempo words in our class in October. But other than that, We'll see you next month. Have a great day.